So when we look at our traditions, especially our mystical traditions, most of them actually struggle quite a bit with the relationship between contemplation or a deep meditative experience and action in the world. The Christian tradition certainly has struggled with that because for a long time, for many, many centuries, we were told that the goal of spiritual life was to essentially check out and get absorbed into the reality of God, reality that is beyond name and etc. And in my experience, and I think that I learned this primarily through my work with homeless youth, not only action can be related to contemplation, action can become contemplation. And the way that I discovered it was through my service that I did with homeless youth on the streets of uh, New York City. I learned contemplative prayer uh, in different monasteries, but I didn't really discover what prayer is until I had this one specific experience with homeless youth. And that was initially when my friend and I co-founded the Reciprocity Foundation, which spent many, many years working with homeless youth and is still very much alive in New York City. Initially, I thought that my role there was to essentially utilize whatever therapeutic techniques I learned and to show up and help people fix their lives. And after a couple of years or so, I discovered that that was actually not working and that that was maybe appropriate or even helpful in some cases, but that wasn't necessarily my vocation. My vocation was quite different. It was about showing up for each person who came to our center in the same way that I would show up for prayer. And how do I show up for prayer? I show up for prayer acknowledging what is alive in me at this particular moment. I bring all of that into the presence of the divine. I name what's present and then I just sit there in this state of receptivity and openness, waiting, trusting that God can somehow descend into my life and take everything that I'm bringing, which is mostly my difficulties, my heartbreaks, uh, and somehow transfigure that into something that could become my gift to the world. And so this is, I think, in a Christian tradition, what contemplative prayer is. Uh, it's learning how to be in a state of receptivity and consent. So that impulse of God that is longing to be present in our lives can be freed and can begin to work in us. So we have to say yes to it and then through us also work in the world. And so the experience that I had with homeless youth when I started showing up in that way, things changed for me. And so every morning I would prepare, I would practice, and then I would show up for every person who came for help to our center, just being there in a state of curious not knowing, putting everything that I know aside and what that meant was that to truly show up for them in that way meant to be present to their pain without any buffers. It meant that I had to accompany them into the depths of their pain, their abuse, their heartbreak. And I noticed when, you know, that wasn't certainly a kind of a very professional way of accompanying someone through healing. But when I would do that, I realized that, you know, I was often right there with them breaking into pieces. But when that happened, every time I realized that underneath it all, there was this something, this presence of God that would just kind of show up in our midst. And that the only thing that we had to do was to just be open to it and say yes to it so it could begin to do the work of healing.
And when that happened, it wasn't really clear who was helping whom. And so I think that for me, that's what engaged contemplation is or contemplative activism is. St. Augustine has this beautiful description where he says that in the innermost cabin of our hearts, there is a sleeping Christ there. In many ways, through our spiritual practice and through our cultivation of devotion and etc., our goal is to wake that Christ up so he can begin to live and work and love through us. And there is also a teaching attributed to St. Teresa of Avila, even though she, I think, never really said it, uh, where she said, Christ has no body but yours on this earth, no heart but yours, no hands but yours. And I love that because that is my experience of prayer, that as one of my Sufi mentors a long time ago said, that the goal of spiritual life is to let God live through me as much as possible. And so to me, that's what connects contemplation and action. Contemplation is about receptivity and saying yes, and action is God acting in us and through us, if we consent. And then, of course, it doesn't mean that we can't be strategic in the world. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have political commitments. It doesn't mean that that we should just kind of sit and wait and not build organizations or get involved in movements. All of that, I think, is very much needed. But the foundation of our being needs to be that experience of letting God live through us as much as possible. The word that people tend to use these days is interspiritual or spiritually independent or spiritual but not religious. And many young people feel very attracted to that. For me, spiritual just really points to being in touch with our roots, the deep stuff in our hearts. And so the practices are there to help us touch those places within ourselves. And also to connect with It's something that holds it all, which for me, as a Christian, is God. But in terms of religion versus non-religious spirituality, I think the difficulty is that I'm seeing in people who are kind of following a post-religious or interspiritual path. I wrote a book encouraging people to do that, as I'm also very much aware of my responsibility. That conversation has been going for a very long time, but... When I look at people who try to practice outside of the tradition versus people who enter the tradition, it seems to me oftentimes that people who enter the tradition tend to make more progress. And the reason for that is not necessarily because the churches or whoever else have all the keys. I mean, the church is pretty messed up. A lot of our institutional traditions are, I dare to say, spiritually bankrupt. But there are still treasures there as well. And I think that one of the treasures is the the maps and the practices. And I think that in these kinds of post-religious circles, people oftentimes pick and choose things from different traditions. And what that means is that sometimes they can't really go beyond just exploring basic questions. And I think within the religious traditions, you see that people kind of just accept a map and then start with a practice. And I think that that generates progress, whether it's a Buddhist tradition or a Christian tradition or a Sufi tradition. And that's why I think it's very important for those groups to be in deep conversation, because those maps can also be passed on to the post-religious world. You know, Bonhoeff would be... Uh, one person who possibly would encourage something like that. I don't have any illusions about the church or the religious traditions, but I think that they still have some treasures worth connecting with, especially around practice and around a framework for what a mature spiritual life looks like and what are the stages of spiritual life. Uh, In some of my work with young people, you know, I see that People adopt a practice 
and they go through this kind of very romantic stage where they feel in love with the divine and it's just a lot of joy and they love you know getting up at 4 a.m and practicing and and then something happens after a couple of years and they hit a dry period and that's when they often feel that they need to change a teacher or change a tradition or change the practice and then they start kind of shopping around and sometimes get lost now if you're in touch with the mystical traditions if you know for example someone like saint john of the cross you understand that that experience of dryness might actually be a sign of progress because according to saint john of the cross that means that you're being invited to go deeper and that the divine is present but your spiritual senses to recognize that presence haven't yet developed and there are specific practices then that are a specific way of being that is assigned to you to develop those spiritual senses so you see that's why i think it's important to to be a student of traditions not in terms of just book knowledge but to actually have relationships with real mentors who have gone into some of those traditions and can speak uh, of their experience of what it's about. Father Beat Griffiths, uh, whom I've actually not met in person, he died before I was even able to speak English. <laughs> I was still in my late teens when he died. But his writings have been very influential in my life. They helped me to trust that this intuition that was attracting me to contemplation is real. And he also helped me to reconcile East with West in terms of Eastern and Western spirituality and those different emphasis, how they can work together. So I've been blessed to have relationships and to receive mentorship from some of his students people like Vandana Mataji who was a hermit sister in India or brother Francis and sister Michaela or Angie Harvey uh, or brother Wayne Teasdale or some of the other people other people who, uh, who really carried his spirit you know, both Matthew Fox and Angie Harvey have been very supportive of my work and have been real elders in my life helping me to kind of give that dangerous permission to trust how I was experiencing God in my life. Rabbi Yehuda Fine really initiated me into what I would call the mysticism of the streets with this very wise Hasidic wisdom of being sent into some of the darkest places to look for sparks of life that were assigned to me for me to raise them up. That was a very influential relationship. There have been many, many other teachers that have just been very gracious and kind and supportive, and I would be lost without them. The book New Monasticism uh, emerged out of a friendship and conversations with my co-author Rory McEntee. And it was really a sacred experience. We spent a couple of years talking almost every day and the framework just kind of emerged out of our conversations. We both felt that we were naming something that that needed to be named, not even for other people, but for our own lives. And initially we uh, created this document, a PDF document that was written for a gathering with Father Thomas Keating, the Trappist monk and a great, really Christian mystic who was very interested in new monasticism and was very supportive of, of new monasticism. So we sent the document to a few people and one Sufi teacher decided to post it on his website. And after a day, if I remember correctly, he emailed us saying over a thousand people downloaded the document. And then within like a week or so, we started receiving uh, messages from all over the world. Someone translated it into Spanish saying how this names something for them, that this is what they've been living, but this gives them the language.
And this was both people who were monastics, who lived in monasteries from hermits to people who had kind of more active religious lives, and also from people who were kind of on the outskirts of our traditions, who wanted to commit their lives to practice. And we were approached by Orbis Books to expand it into a book, which we welcomed that opportunity, and we worked on it for, for a little bit. A lot of that work really happened over a decade ago. It's important to qualify because now we've had a decade of people actually working with that book. I stand by most of the things in that book. New monasticism is a real thing. I'm still involved in new monasticism. So many people feel to have a contemplative life in the world where action and contemplation can meet. So many people feel that they want to pursue their spiritual journey outside of the religious or organized religion. I support that, even as a priest. I think what I would engage with differently would be this. Even though we say that this demands serious practice, that this demands serious discernment, that you can't really do this without proper mentors, without being situated in a community. This is not an individualistic journey, especially in the US, which is a very kind of individualistic country. Many people still try to do it on their own. Do yourself spirituality. And so I think that if I were to work on that book again, I would actually give uh, some more parameters for how to practice this for how to find a mentor, for what a healthy community looks like, for what are the practices, and also tell people to be discerning and cautious about following this path outside of the established traditions, because if they feel called to do that, that means that they will be co-creating that path. And that means that they really have to have good mentors, that they have to be part of a community that can invite them into this experience of learning how to be vulnerable, learning how to receive feedback. In a spiritual life, it's so easy to make mistakes. When we just rely on our inner guidance, I mean, so many things can go wrong inner guidance, or in a Christian tradition, what we call the guidance of the Holy Spirit is very important. But all of that is meant to be then brought into one's spiritual director, into one's community, where people can authenticate what you're receiving or sometimes critique it. And I think that's very healthy. And so I would add more on that. But I think the book as a whole, I think, still works to some extent, and I still receive messages from people who, who have read it and felt uh, inspired by it. And, and I'm grateful that I was able to participate in the writing of that book with Rory McEntee, who, who's also a great theologian. You know, his gifts are so also evident in that book. My advice for anyone who wishes to practice deeply would be to adopt a practice that gives them a sense of connectedness to the sacred, to the presence. Number two, it would be to get a psychotherapist who can help them to make sure that they are not using their spiritual practice to bypass their trauma, their wounds. Number three would be to invite them into a community uh, of like-minded people, where people commit to a specific rule of life, uh, to honesty, uh, to being with each other in a way that helps them to learn how to be vulnerable, that helps them to learn how to confess their shortcomings, that helps them to learn how to offer or receive forgiveness. So those would be my three kind of basics. And then, of course, uh, eventually one needs some kind of a spiritual teacher or a tradition 
that can guide them or a spiritual director. I've had quite a few Eastern mentors. In fact, I rediscovered uh, the Christian tradition in a Hindu monastery. Most of my mentors have been either Hindu or Sufi, and not necessarily Buddhists. When I think about, especially in terms of working with young people, and when I think about spirituality, I think about three levels that are needed in whatever our approach is to spiritual life. The first one is therapeutic practices that can kind of help us to deal with our emotions, with our reactivity, with all that kind of messy stuff in our lives. And as we look into that, uh, we realize that some of those things are messengers that we were not really designed for the kind of a world that we live in a world of injustice, but also a world where people from far away are expected to be able to get in touch with us at any moment where we need to be connected all the time in our nervous systems. So the therapeutic then leads to the activist where we then kind of see actually some things around us need to be changed. Some systems need to be changed. And then the last one is the piece about the supernatural or cosmological or mystical, that it's not necessarily enough to just kind of deal with the therapeutic or even with changing the world, that we need to be grounded in a vision where we are held by a reality that gives us courage, that gives us life, that gives us a very specific purpose in how we are to do our lives, right? And so Christianity versus Buddhism, <laughs> I think Buddhism is amazing and much better than Christianity when it comes to the therapeutic. Uh, Christianity actually doesn't have many practices or even trainings uh, as to how to deal with a lot of our inner stuff. You're just asked to pray. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. And when you go into contemplative prayer, even that is not really mainstream Christianity. <laughs> even though contemplative prayer is probably older than most things that we do in church, nonetheless, it's not really mainstream at this time. So I think Buddhism is very skilled at helping us with the therapeutic. It is also very skilled in helping us to move from the inner to the outer in terms of action and uh, in the world, uh, in terms of developing compassion, in terms of developing equanimity. Specific practices attached to each of those qualities of being that we can develop. And then when it comes to the supernatural, Buddhism actually doesn't really talk much about it. I mean, you have some teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh and others who even occasionally venture into using the word God. But a lot of Buddhism actually doesn't really talk about the supernatural. In Buddhism, you just kind of touch that reality without necessarily talking about it, which means that there are less dangers of projection or being caught in some kind of a dogmatic system, you know, your theology versus my theology and etc. What I appreciate in Buddhism and living in, an, in this kind of a Buddhist Christian household, what I really appreciate about that is simple but very profound practices that do not talk much about God or any other world but this, but yet when we engage in them, my experience of those practices is for example, loving-kindness meditation. Uh, you don't talk about God. So a Christian, when, when a Christian approaches loving-kindness, we think, are we just like sending our loving thoughts to someone? My experience of that practice is if you really enter it, you find yourself being in God, dispensing blessings from the heart of God. Even though none of that is mentioned, but that's my experience. That's the gift of Buddhism. The gift of Christianity is 
this kind of an incarnational framework of a God who calls you by name and who pronounces a blessing on you and calls you to a very specific task in this life. And enlightenment or holiness is not supposed to happen somewhere else, but here. God wants to descend into your very body. So your body and your being can be transformed. Then you can start touching the world and create transformation there. The two traditions actually are very complementary. Thich Nhat Thanh talked about the Buddha and Christ meeting every day in his heart, in his practice. This has been a great blessing for me because Buddhism is just so good with simple, but not simplistic, very profound practices that help us immediately to touch that reality that I, as a Christian, would say, I'm touching God. Buddhists might be very uncomfortable with that language because God is just a word. But I think that the two beautifully complement each other, at least how I am experiencing it, and I come at it from a Christian perspective. I've struggled with embodiment in my life for a variety of reasons. One, I think, was when I was a child, I was kind of a very ill and weak child. So early on, I learned how to mistrust my body, as my body was something that was kind of working against me almost. I also, as a kid, had an experience where an older friend tried to take advantage of me sexually. That didn't happen, but it left... I felt violated. So again, the body was kind of vulnerable. And I grew up around big statues of Lenin and Stalin, of these big figures who were always portrayed as bigger than life. They were ideals. And so the message that I internalized is that it's about ideals, not about particulars. Part of my attraction to monastic life was just about trying to bypass my hurt, my trauma, and etc. And it's only in my 20s when I went to psychotherapy, when I began engaging with body practices, and that I discovered that for me, exercise is probably the most important prayer practice that I can do. Because it's not the only thing that I need to do, but it really puts everything else, enables everything else, I would say. I think the body is very important, and for me it has been a lifelong journey, and I still try to do my best every day to move, not always successfully. And I think the body is very important in terms of cultivating a vessel into which the presence of God can descend, a holy temple in which God can live. In terms of talking about the presence of God, Something that I am very much aware of in my life is that most of the good things that happen in my life, it's all God. And I know that because I don't have a lot of great skill sets. I can do what I can do. So I don't have any illusions <laughs> about having some kind of great abilities or something like that. It's God. And so all I can do is just trust and cultivate this mind, body, soul, or whatever we want to spirit being uh, to be responsive to that presence. And that requires practice, and I'm trying to do my best to, to do that. <laughs> And the hair really takes me back to Poland uh, during those years of resistance and uh, youth movements. 
a lot of us were influenced by Rastafarian culture and tradition. Rasta poets and activists uh, from England and from Jamaica started coming to Poland to support the Polish Revolution. And as a result, the Polish Revolution also, especially for young people, was connected to the revolution in South Africa. So when the Solidarity Movement was allowed to do a first legal public happening, it was a concert, uh, so Solidarity with South Africa. I think it was called Solidarity Anti-Apartheid Concert with a lot of Jamaican and British Jamaican artists who came to Poland and who supported us, but who also gave us a message. Not necessarily passing on the Rasta spirituality to us, but helping us to get in touch with our own spirituality, emphasizing the importance of being vegetarian, of having a healthy life, of interpreting our scripture through a lens of liberation. So I was very much influenced by that. And so having dreadlocks in Poland as a result of that was a symbol of not going along with status quo. And that was a direct influence, you know, from, from Jamaican culture and Rasta philosophy. And many people in the youth movement adopted that because we felt that, that was brought to us and offered to us as a way of resistance by some of those Rastas who were coming to Poland. When my grandmother saw me for the first time, you know, when my hair started locking, she had a name for that because it turned out that actually people had this in Poland for a very long time. It just kind of disappeared for a moment, I think. The oldest art pieces portraying an equivalent of dreadlocks in Poland goes back to, I think, at least 15th or 16th century. And there was a kind of a folk belief that if you got this, you couldn't cut it, that it was somehow connected to the other world, and that you would be punished if you cut it or something like that, some of the, the folk tradition. But so I've maintained that you know, because this became part of me. Wherever I go in the world, when there's a Rasta passing by, they, they often not. It's almost like this invisible community of people who care about liberation, who care about black liberation, uh, but also liberation of any oppressed people around the world. So that's where it comes from. We received it as a gift that uh, I believe was offered to us as a, as a form of resistance and a lifestyle to build our bodies and, our, to, and grow our souls to be able to resist oppression. The name of the book, Let Your Heartbreak Be Your Guide, Lessons in Engaged Contemplation. The first part of the title comes from one of the stories in the book. And the story is this, that after giving a talk in London a few years ago at this beautiful center for peace and reconciliation, and a young woman approached me uh, to have a conversation. And she came with some serious vocational questions, questions that young people often ask. What am I going to do with my life? I feel lost, unhappy. I would like to do something meaningful in this world that seems to be falling apart. And as I sat with her and, and listened, I didn't feel that I had anything. <laughs> but I remember the advice that I actually got early on from, from Angie Harvey who said, people might be telling you to do what gives you, you know, joy or happiness. And he said, you know, don't follow your bliss. And he, I'm sure, was referring to like the famous bumper stickers, follow your bliss. <laughs> don't follow your bliss. Look where that has gotten us to. Follow your heartbreak. Let your heartbreak be your guide. And so that's what I said to her. And then I forgot about that conversation. I remember almost actually missing it. 
<laughs> flight back to New York because we talked for so long, but I forgot about that conversation until a few months later where she emailed me and told me what happened. She said that she sat with that question, what breaks your heart for a long time, and that that produced quite a bit of frustration for her. And then one day in her process, she turned on the TV and so all these Syrian refugees arriving on the island of uh, Lesbos, uh, that was the time. And something, just when she saw those images of children, women and men, she just felt completely shattered. Without telling anyone, she booked a ticket and went there and just joined the efforts, picking people up from, from the Mediterranean Sea. And she said that being there and witnessing that completely devastated her, but it also put her in touch with joy. Not the kind of joy that can stand anything difficult, but the kind of joy that survives even when your heart is breaking because you're in touch with so much pain, so much suffering. And that's the title of the book. And, and in the book, the reflections that I offer there include stories, some scriptural interpretations, uh, some practices about how to follow our heartbreaks. You know, in a world where, I mean, look at all the uh, shootings that are happening, look at all the systemic racism, look at the ecological devastation and people wanting to spend more money on military and weapons and, you know, all the nonsense. It's hard to walk out of the house in the morning and and that feels shattered when we look around. And so this book is really a response to that, how to live with that in a way where we can be invited to understand that every time we feel that, we are actually in touch with a bigger heartbreak, with the heartbreak of God. And that our wounds are sacred wounds that are held with so much love by the divine and that we need to respond to that. In terms of the heart itself, the heart is the center, our spiritual center. That place deep within where there is a sacred chapel there and an altar. And that's where we go to connect with the divine. It's that place in us where our body, our mind, our thoughts, everything can kind of come together there in a beautiful way. We can become a mirror of the divine light where we can reflect that into the world. If we do our work, our inner work of spiritual practice, even though in the Christian tradition, contemplation is not something we accomplish, it's a gift. But the work that we need to do is the work of preparing ourselves. So when that presence is available to us, we can actually receive it. So we won't miss it. When I was growing up in Poland, I was born in 1975. I left Poland in 1992. And when I was a kid, uh, it was a totalitarian state, especially around the time when Poland went into the state of emergency. I remember on that day actually traveling from a little village where I was staying with my grandparents to a city where my home was and uh, where my parents were. And I was traveling with my uncle and my aunt. Uh, and we decided to stop at their house and spend the night. Uh, and I remember waking up in the morning and there was this announcement on television that Poland is going into the direct kind of translation into English would be into the state of war. And so we were not allowed to leave that town because you needed a special government permission to travel. And overnight, there were tanks on the streets of our cities. TV presenters and news people were wearing military uniforms. 
Mm. And it was very shocking. But this was just another manifestation of what felt like violence from the state. And so growing up, I was very much aware of this dynamic that we were born into a world, into a situation, into a country where everything was so tightly controlled. What was kind of present in our hearts, there was no room for that. The only free places were really churches where we could go and articulate our dreams, where we could talk about a different world that we imagined a world of justice and solidarity, a world that valued things like reciprocity and freedom of speech. Growing up, I saw what some of my friends, especially older friends, were doing in order to deal with that situation. And many of them were just drinking themselves to death, literally. And that was their way of coping with the violence, coping with the hopelessness, coping with just feeling stuck. And yet there was this movement happening in Poland, the Solidarity Movement, which was a non-violent resistance movement. And paying attention to that, I saw that it was possible to make a different choice, that it was possible to organize with other people, small circles where we could share together some of the dreams that we had for the kind of life that we wanted, for the kind of world that we wanted, and that those dreams then could translate into a new political system. For many people, social change is more of a theoretical longing for me, it's not because I saw one system collapsing and a new system emerging. And so that's why I tend to say that there are two choices. One was to become an alcoholic and another choice was to become an activist. But in Poland, most of the activism that I was exposed to was very much rooted in spirituality especially was connected to the Catholic Church, because in Poland at that time, most of the people were Catholic, Catholic or communist. And so as a child, I was able to witness some really courageous people, some of whom were priests, who seemed to have a special connection with the divine. And whatever they were experiencing in their prayer life, translated into something that enabled them to speak truth to power, something that enabled them to say, even though you're trying to kill me, even though most likely you will kill me, just so you know, I forgive you because God forgives you. And that was a very powerful experience for me to witness that. And of course, some of those guys got killed by the state, including a priest in a parish where I was baptized. He was one of those non-violent resistance rebel priests, and he was killed by the state. And that happened almost at the end of the regime. He was one of the last victims of the state, just so we would know that they are still in charge. I initially started working with homeless kids in India and then I spent some time doing that in Orlando and then finally uh, in New York. But very early on, on our journey, we helped someone, this transgender young woman, to get on America's Next Step model, which at that time was a, a very prominent show. And she did very well and as a result became a well-known advocate and now she's doing really well, not only as an activist, but also making films and, uh, and etc. And so a lot of homeless youth in New York City were very inspired by that. A transgender young person could end up on a mainstream 
television show. And that was quite a few years ago. Now this is more common, but back then it was possibly the first time that that happened. And so all these kids started showing up in our center. And one of the questions that they would often ask was, could you help me to become famous? And, you know, I really struggled with that because I thought, <laughs> goodness, it's not necessarily my life's calling to help people become famous. And then after a while, as I kind of sat with that question, it clicked that what they were actually asking me was, can you help me to have a life of meaning, purpose and significance? It's just that the theology that they had was a reality TV theology. And so within that framework, if you want to have a life of meaning, purpose and significance, you get on television, right? And so once I understood that, I think something opened up in my understanding of how to work with young people who are functioning in a more of a post-religious world. Uh, many young people that I have worked with uh, identify as LGBTQ. Many of them have been really badly hurt by churches and they come from all traditions. Horrible stories that I've heard over the years. So many kids end up on the street because their pastor or their priest tells their parents this is a sin kick them out, otherwise they will pollute your household or something like that, which is absolutely crazy. I don't know what Bible they are reading. But many young people that I've worked with were hurt by religion. And so I think what makes a lot of sense, and you know, religions, organized religions, to some extent, it seems, are kind of going out of business. Someone told me about my own denomination that by 2050 there will be zero people going to church. Uh, of course, miracles do happen, but we will see. But I think the framework that I've embraced is this. Not a lot of people have the language or want to engage in a language of the divine or religion or even spirituality. But most people struggle with this one question. What the hell am I going to do with my life? Right? And so I discovered that a good way to help people to begin to engage in their spirituality is to help them to discover their calling, their vocation. Again, relating it to that idea that God is longing to live through us. And so what I've learned is when I work with young people, I often work with these two questions. What breaks your heart and what makes you truly alive? Because I've learned that if people really spend time with these questions, holding them with everything that they have, something cracks in their operating system and, and they oftentimes experience this something arising in them. And to me, I call that the impulse of God. And all of a sudden, they get an insight, they get a sense of who they need to be in order to be happy, in order to have a life of meaning, purpose, and significance. But when I say vocation or happy, I don't just mean do whatever will give you positive feelings. I mean do something where your gifts can be connected to the heartbreaks of the world. And the way that I understand it is that when we discover who we are, when we discover what our role in this life is, whether we call it that or not, it's the divine fully kind of manifesting in us, uh, taking everything that we have uh, and turning into something that becomes our contribution. I had this Hasidic rabbi uh, mentor who in the 60s when everyone was very interested in 
the Eastern gurus. He went and met all the, all the people who were coming here from the East, and he liked some of them, but then he thought, I'm Jewish, I really kind of feel connected to my tradition. Could I find some of those spiritual masters that her holy books talk about? So he went to the Holy Land and was able to, to, to meet a couple of very special Hasidic masters who survived the Holocaust. And some of them came from Eastern Europe. And the teaching that he gave me that, that came from that tradition was very simple. He said, everyone comes here into this world with one thing to fix. And you have to discover what you're here to fix. What you're here to fix, no one else can fix. And so it's very important that you become who you are meant to be. That is that question of vocation. And so when we can guide someone into their vocation, that's not just an idea, oh, I want to do so and so. Oftentimes, in my experience, it's actually a very illuminating experience, a very visceral experience. And if you can kind of guide people in a contemplative way to touch that place within themselves, you see they become alive. So what I often do when someone is having that experience, as they kind of reflect on their heartbreaks and their aliveness, I tell them, you know, that thing that you're feeling right now, that's what people call God. You can use that word or not. And then all of a sudden, it makes sense to introduce them to spiritual practices. Because those spiritual practices are not about like seven steps to fix your life or, or even enlightenment. Those practices are there to help you stay connected to the experience that you just had. To help you live from that place. From that place of aliveness, that place of passion, that place of holiness. I think the language of vocation uh, and calling is very helpful when we work with young people who are functioning in a post-religious world. It doesn't mean that our traditions don't have anything to offer. We do, and they do. But I think what we're also seeing in Gen Z and millennials is that so many people feel called to be exploring spirituality outside of organized religions. And I think religious people and clergy especially oftentimes just dismiss that, saying, oh, they're, you know, they lack commitment. When you talk to some of those people, they often spend more time practicing than <laughs> the clergy who are criticizing them. So I would be very cautious about dismissing that. But at the same time, I think that the traditions have an opportunity to engage in deep conversations and offer their frameworks for spiritual practice, their maps of, of how spiritual development happens, but in a way that is not possessive, not to win people over, but rather to enter this kind of a reciprocal way of being with the young generation through which both sides can greatly benefit and deepen. The language of true self sometimes is very problematic because when people get on the journey they sometimes tend to idealize who they are. And so the language of no self sometimes can be very helpful in terms of uh, dismantling our illusions about who we are, uh, dismantling different processes that are active in us, uh, that manifest in very specific ways, as reactivity, as selfishness, and etc. Different traditions certainly have different views on that, or at least different language to talk about that and give people access to different aspects of the divine and therefore and that's why those experiences and paths can be so complementary. For me personally, and I'll speak from a Christian tradition, however in a Christian tradition we don't necessarily talk about the disappearance of the self. We talk about 
uh, dying to self, where we kind of disappear and dissolve only to discover who we really are in God. So there is a process of dying that takes place, but your uniqueness and, and your individuality doesn't necessarily disappear. Uh, but who you thought you were definitely does. It's a paradox and, and one can't really talk about it adequately. But from my perspective, it's exactly what I talked about at the beginning. You cease to exist as you envision yourself to be, only so you can begin to exist as God envisions you to be. Even though uh, getting there feels like a complete loss of self and even loss of life, it feels like a crucifixion of sorts. Nonetheless, uh, in that experience, then you discover that you are actually more yourself than you've ever been. St. John of the Cross has this beautiful teaching that I really love, where he talks about a piece of wood and, and a fire. And he says, when you throw the wood into fire, If the wood is wet, the smell is often nasty, the smoke is kind of not very beautiful. And the wood, before it can catch the fire, sheds all the tears that are inside of it. And then once it's dry, that piece of wood can no longer do but what the fire does. In the Christian tradition, I mean, that's the experience of the divine union or the sacred marriage. But again, we don't necessarily say that we, as individuals per se, don't exist. In Buddhism, it's talked about differently. In Advaita Vedanta, that's talked about uh, differently. I personally think that all of those experiences and realizations uh, complement each other. And any language or theology for me is really just a functional narrative that helps us to dive into uh, the actual experience of transformation. Language is limited. But I think those differences in the traditions are, are also very important and shouldn't just be dismissed. even more important than living in community is practicing in community. There are plenty of examples of people who live together but who have difficulties being in relationships with each other. Living in community without proper practices and proper skill sets that can be developed is actually dangerous <laughs> and can be explosive. But with proper practices and proper guidance, it could be very beneficial. And especially in this day and age, when our institutions seem to be collapsing, we have to go back to our basics and learn how to cooperate, learn how to be in deep relationships with each other, learn how to help each other to carry our pain and our wounds and learn how to grow food together and how to share resources. And so I think in that sense, communities are really the future. Because when I look around, I don't see much hope in our institutions. I don't see too many possibilities for transformation when it comes to our political system. But a lot could be accomplished by people who intentionally come together in a conscious way uh, to develop their hearts, to learn how to be together, to learn how to grow their souls, to learn how to grow food, to learn how to share resources, and to learn how to be responsible for each other. For those of us who are religious junkies, so to speak, we tend to think that to manifest Christ's nature, you know, we need another Mother Teresa or we need another Oscar Romero or Dr. King. And that might be true. But I feel that some of the most holy people that I've met in my life have actually been pretty ordinary people. Ordinary monastics who are not looking for any publicity. Uh, ordinary parents who 
run their households with so much love, where, where you enter that home, you just feel touched deeply by the reality of love. For each person, it looks differently, uh, depending on how we are called to manifest Christ or to manifest our Buddha nature in the world. How do we nourish that in ourselves? This is where especially a fusion of Christianity and Buddhism can be very helpful. Buddhism offers us some very specific, beautiful practices where each of our breath can touch that reality, where each step can help us to be open uh, to that mystery. Christianity gives us this gift of realizing that that reality, while it's not necessarily a person in a way that you or I are persons. Nonetheless, it is personal. And what I mean by personal is that that reality loves us. Living in awareness of that and utilizing some of those practices that can put us in direct contact with that change us and enable us to be infused with that presence and then to take that presence into the world in our own unique way. For some people that means, you know, a big way in terms of, like, I think of Dr. King, for example. And for some people it means a quiet way. But both are equally important. I have hermit friends who never really interact with many people but I know that they're holding the whole world on their hearts when they pray. I feel they're praying for me, they're praying for us every day. That's their mission. And that's beautiful. That's what we need. <laughs>